I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Many of us intuitively or otherwise know that there's more to the picture about heart disease than the conventional approach. The question then is how do we find out and learn and do more so that we feel we're really thoroughly covered from a functional medicine perspective in our heart health. Today, we are fortunate enough to be joined by my friend and colleague to take a journey through this topic and we'll be working with Dr. Sandra Fleming. She's a board certified family medicine physician with residency training in both internal and family medicine. This includes working in a level one trauma center in Brooklyn, New York, and in underserved hospital and uh, clinic in Portsmouth, Virginia. Dr. Fleming is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a RECODE certified practitioner helping to prevent and reverse Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. Fleming feels fortunate to be a part of a beautiful community in Fort Bragg, California. She has a love for the ocean, nature, and animals. You may find her hiking or biking with her husband on the numerous scenic trails, kayaking the local rivers, or enjoying time with her four ducks, one chicken, and two dogs. Dr. Sandra, <laughs> thanks for being here today. Thanks, thanks, Rob. I, I will have to say uh, we're down a couple ducks because uh, we had a we had a visitor, uh, a mountain lion, and mm. uh, I was fortunate enough to be there, but unfortunately couldn't save the poor little ducks. So mm. we're down to two, uh, two ducks, one chicken. Yeah, but uh, but we got everybody else. It Thanks. reminds me of a discussion I had with one of my patients when I used to work across the bay in Seldovia. This. Uh, woman and her family felt that they did better with duck eggs than chicken eggs in terms of food tolerance. And so at a follow-up visit, I asked her how the duck egg thing was going and her Malamute had eaten her ducks. And so <laughs> <laughs> poor woman, <laughs> poor duck. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry to hear about your loss. <laughs> yeah, we quit naming them actually. But uh, Anyway, yeah. yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Rob. Um, it's just a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you today. And, uh, and you know, I do have a message and I, I, I think that you do as well. And, and we know that um, reversing heart disease, preventing heart disease is huge. And I, and I call that my Save My Heart mm -hmm. campaign. And, and that's what I'm trying to do right now because obviously that's the number one killer. And we all, as practitioners, really need to do something about it on a regular basis uh, and not wait for the disease to set in, but prevent, 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 right? Oh, yeah. I think this is so great that we're getting to have this conversation. Super important. And there's so many dimensions of this mm -hmm. that are, are beyond conventional and I've had the privilege of seeing folks over the years benefit from anything from a more expanded cholesterol profile to uh, types of testing that give people information earlier in the game and give them uh, non-drug and lifestyle solutions. So couldn't be more excited. Yeah, yeah. Should we start then by having you talk with us about the multiple root causes of heart disease? Yeah, and I'll keep it simple. You know, in, in, in functional medicine, there's some terms that we, we like to throw around and, and, and we all know the, the, the key ones, right? Oxidative stress, right? Um, and then we also know that insulin dysfunction is, is huge, very huge in cardiovascular disease uh, as a root cause and vascular dysfunction, autoimmune dysfunction, as well as inflammation. Simplified version is metabolic dysfunction. So we know there's a lot of biochemical processes going on in our body systems. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in conventional medicine, you know, allopathic medicine, we, we do kind of miss the mark and we don't get to those root causes. But I think you and I, our mission today is hopefully to attract practitioners of, of every type to this podcast, right? So that they can get a, just a glimpse of, hey, 
what testing should I be doing? What should I be thinking? What should I have in my court to help that person right in front of me who looks healthy, but may not be healthy inside? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sighing because I'm thinking about how, as I was trained, the management of heart problems, it really felt to me like the the whole approach was developed in the hospital and the intensive care unit and the ER. This was, my phrase has been sort of eighth and ninth inning medicine, Mm -hmm. almost chasing backwards through the causes from the heart attack, retroactively working back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so thankful that functional medicine feels to me like first and second and third inning medicine where we're really able to see way out in advance these silent processes and what the consequences could be and and uh, another term would be upstream we're able to work upstream that would be perfect perfect example but you know and even when you mentioned that you were in the hospital and when i was in the hospital we were ordering those you know hscrps Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. because of that paper that came out in 2002 with peter libby Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's Paul Ritker and then Attilio Masseri. So that came out and and kind of shined some light on the inflammatory process of mm-hmm. atherosclerosis. And so we started ordering those HSCRPs, mm-hmm. but we didn't know what to do with it, mm-hmm. right? And so I remember in residency, you know, we would order it, and I would okay refer to a cardiologist, and then it was out of my hands. I didn't go, mm-hmm. I didn't dig deeper. Right. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm learning more about all the different cardiac marketers that are out there and all the different ways that we can test and get to the root causes of the inflammation and just to expand our toolkit, if you will, of there's multiple causes. Right. That you and I know, you know, the microbiome. Right. That's huge right now. Mm-hmm. Anything that can cause a dysbiosis and imbalance in your gut, right? That can cause inflammation and it can affect yeah. our heart, right? And as well as our oral health, our dental hygiene, it matters, right? The toxins that are we consume in our bodies or put on our skin or breathe in, all that can cause inflammation. Insulin resistance, right? We know one in three patients, adults, I should say, in America are pre-diabetic and over 80% don't know they have pre-diabetes, right? So that's, there's just so much to cardiovascular disease and we've come a long way, but at the same point, we haven't caught up with that information because like I said, that was 2002 that that information came on board linking inflammation to heart disease. But where it's now at 2022, and we're a little bit behind. Yeah. yeah. We'll catch should, up. Right. That's our job, right? <laughs> as dual trained providers, I see that as one of our most important roles is that we can be in this conventional domain and also shine a light on more. I was at a meeting where folks were deciding whether to do a high sensitivity C-reactive protein measure of silent inflammation as part of our community health fair. Oh, wow. And so great one, idea. Of, one of the other physicians present said, well, if it comes back elevated, what can you do about it? And I said, an anti-inflammatory food plant, curcumin, high dose omega-3 fatty acid, I could go on Absolutely. Ad, ad nauseum as a functional medicine doctor, I'm essentially an inflammologist. Yeah. But, You're like, how much time do you have? Because we can talk about this for right, a really long right. time. <laughs> and it was a really poignant moment for me in that it was a reminder that just by human nature, we're not going to ask as many questions if we don't have tools in our toolbox. And again, Absolutely. the the irony would be if we use something like Celebrex or ibuprofen or what have you to drive down an HS uh, elevated high sensitivity C-reactive protein, we'd be microscopically punching holes in the gut barrier and feeding the inflammation upstream while we quench it at the level of the C-reactive protein. So not a good idea. No wonder, no wonder <laughs> that it, it would, when we're only doing the conventionally trained approach, we're sort of disincentivized to be, mm-hmm. be curious because it feels, feels kind of like a non-starter. Right. So 
we we're not being routinely tested for these. You illuminated though that the that the tools are there. Should we talk about insulin resistance next? Yeah, we can talk about insulin resistance. So, as I said, one in three Americans, you know, running around out there, they don't know they have it. Um, so, we know that insulin resistance is tied to heart disease. Okay, and in there's a lot of different ways that we can develop insulin resistance. And obviously diet is what everyone knows, you know, eat, eat too much sugar, you're eventually gonna weaken your pancreas and you're just not gonna be able to handle that glucose load, right? Mm -hmm. Or genotype, maybe our, you know, mom and dad had diabetes, so we un got the unfortunate gene. Um, but we forget about toxins, right? out there in our environment that can put us at risk for insulin resistance, okay? Whether it's pesticides, the plastics that we, the Tupperware that we're putting in the microwave or whatever, and we're heating up, or, you know, if we're drinking too much wine that has Roundup, you know, that they use for fertilizer, right? So those toxins put us at risk of insulin resistance. Um, and then just poor mitochondrial dysfunction, not having the cofactors, those micronutrients in our bodies. Um, I had a patient, perfect example, very, very thin guy, no family history of diabetes or prediabetes. And, you know, we, you know, I just did as kind of a starting A1C. Obviously there, there's a better way of checking for insulin resistance, as you know, but with the two hour OGT, but um, OGTT, but he came back prediabetes. And this is just a thin guy and, and we're both scratching our, our heads. And he's like, well, I eat a pretty good diet. You know, I'm actually a vegetarian. Why, why do I have prediabetes? I said, well, let's go ahead and do some nutrient marker testing. And sure enough, he was deficient in multiple nutrients. So that's mm -hmm. factors, right? Mm -hmm. For the Krebs cycle, for the electron transport chain, right? If you don't have those crucial cofactors, you're not going to run your biochemistry and therefore you're not going to be able to metabolize glucose, take it up into the cells, get it out of the bloodstream. So this thin vegetarian patient of mine is at risk of heart disease, right? Yeah. So, um, but you know, a lot of different things um, that we can go on and on about insulin resistance and all the different possibilities, but um, and then the altered body composition, that visceral pot fat around our bellies that puts us at risk, but it goes back to inflammation. Mm -hmm. It always goes back to inflammation. And that is the, the trigger for heart disease. So, and insulin resistance is just one of the pieces. It's a big piece, but it's one of the pieces. And I think for our audience's benefit, because it's so important I'd like to add my aha moment. This was watching Mark Hyman do one of his educate, one of his hundreds, if not thousands of educational. He's great. I get a lot of info now. from him too. Yeah. He's Over got some years. great speakers too. So he, he said that he talked about this lock and key phenomenon where we've got the blood sugar floating around and then the insulin has to be released by the pancreas and go to the keyhole in the cell and open the cell to let the blood sugar in. And the big moment for me was him talking about how the insulin levels will climb for months or years before the sugar will climb. And that there are the same adverse consequences to having high levels of insulin mm -hmm. and the insulin resistance to that signaling as very, very similar consequences to having frankly elevated blood sugar. And so this is what seems to have helped my patients the most is having this conversation that that silent insulin phenomenon mm -hmm. needs yeah. to be illuminated so that then they're empowered to understand it better and do something about it. And just the lights come on over and over and over again. People are so relieved. I'll be so excited to hear the testing you're doing and what you recommend. For me, it's been a fasting insulin and a, a fasting blood sugar and a hemoglobin A1C. That little triad has been really helpful. I do the same. Problem. I do the same. Um, but I'm, I'm realizing 
that that two hour oral glucose tolerance test, which we all know with pregnancy, we do that for women. But um, that's the superior test. Mm, interesting. It, it yeah. really is. It really is. And and I don't know if it's just a convenience thing that patients don't want to sit around the lab after drinking this this sugary drink, right? But especially for those patients who their chemistry, their glucose comes back, you know, normal, right? It, it might be a good step. And of course, if you're anemic, your A1C, hemoglobin A1C is going to be falsely low. So yeah. that's, yeah, there's a lot of conditions that could be missed. Well, for our audience, let's uh, give them some, some contextual pieces. So the uh, hemoglobin A1C or glycosylated hemoglobin, that checks how many sugar molecules are stuck to a hemoglobin. This is for our lay audience so they can benefit as well. And mm -hmm. so if we put a hemoglobin molecule in a beaker of dilute sugar and another one in a beaker of syrupy, sugary, uh, what have you, and then we pull those hemoglobins out 10 weeks later, the number of sugars stuck to the hemoglobin tells us what sugar has been doing for about 10 weeks. And as Dr. Sandra just pointed out, if we don't have as many hemoglobin molecules, we can get a, a falsely low estimate of what's happening. And then this two hour blood sugar challenge, many of us trained in medical care have used this a lot to see if women's sugars are gonna climb during pregnancy. And what Dr. Sanders pointing out to us is that this is a really powerful way to find insulin resistance. Is that, is that an accurate summary? Absolutely. You drink this nasty yeah. sugar water. Our patients yeah. always complain, all of this was just yeah. hideous. Even if they have a sweet tooth, I've never heard a single one of them say that they enjoyed <laughs> sucking down this it was 27 years ago for me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh even though they find it hideous it's super revealing because that glucose load is going to reveal the insulin mm -hmm. resistance if the blood sugar is elevated by two hour later three yeah. hour later criteria yes it's just it's a superior test yeah yeah Absolutely. yeah and Fantastic. you don't want to miss it don't want to miss Fantastic. it yeah and, yeah because as you said the disease process starts what 10 years before mm -hmm. right so we yes. right we really really need to catch it as earlier as early as possible but another thing and i just want to segue into um cimt testing carotid intimamedial thickness tech testing so i want to just give a shout out to vasolabs and that's a company that i have i'm working with for save my heart campaign and and they're doing ultrasounds, carotid ultrasounds, but they have a way they dialed it in and figured out how to check the wall, the lining, right? The thickness, right? And give you a score and to pick up early plaque formation. And this is just a better ultrasound, way better than the standard carotid ultrasounds. But again, it's a way, another tool in the toolkit to detect early disease processes. Right. 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 Prevention. It's all about prevention. Yeah. Let's, let's definitely expand on that because I think it's going to be so interesting to people. I think it's so important and some, some puzzle pieces I'd like to share there is that the first inter, uh, Institute for functional medicine annual international conference I went to was Mark Houston, who yeah. is a functional medicine cardiologist at Vanderbilt and he laid out this whole map for how far in advance of a heart attack, the first plaques get laid down in the blood vessels of the body. We know that some of the Korean war veterans who gave permission and died in combat allowed their blood vessels to be examined when they came back. And some of them were laying down cholesterol plaque in their twenties. Yeah. And uh, fast forward, you don't, um, you know, you may maybe need a 90% blockage of a blood vessel to have chest pain and a 50 to 70% blockage to cut off blood flow or, or pardon me, pardon me, I misspoke for a piece to break off and go downstream and cause a heart attack or a stroke. So okay. we need to find this. Yeah. We need to find this stuff earlier. And then these sophisticated technologies and I'll, there's a significant likelihood I'll be working with these same folks you just mentioned because you advise them to talk to me and I'll be talking to them soon. And I've been really 
uh, it used to be that you'd have to buy a many thousands of dollar device. And now a company like you described can provide the device to you and right there in the office, you can look and see if there's these markers of uh, troubles in the blood vessel in the early going. And that informs people's decision-making around their cholesterol targets, additional labs, lifestyle. I've also found that that many patients are data-driven. So this conjecture yeah. that they might need to take care of themselves versus here's the data, right? Yeah. really different. Is that your experience also? Knowledge is power. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I, I say it to my patients. I say it to my family. I say it to myself, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, it's, it's really important, like you said, to gather the data, mm-hmm. know the facts, let it, and just, we're human, right? If we don't see it in front of our face, we don't believe it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where I think every practitioner in America needs to be ordering the appropriate labs, you know, get it done early as possible, right? Do the screening, you know, and just get the ultrasound done. Don't be afraid just because insurance won't pay for it. Just order the test. Right. And there's so many lab companies out there right now. Patients can order the labs themselves. Right. And, and, you know, lots of different lab companies and and life extension, I think all Alta labs, I just learned about them yesterday, I'm sure. And then some sort of direct labs or there's lots of different lab companies. The patients are, are, are becoming smarter than their physician, to be honest. Right. With all this, stuff all this new research that comes out every day they they're taking the time to to read up on it and so i encourage patients if your practitioner isn't going to order the tests for you then just go seek it out and order it yourself and then once you get the results back find your local integrative or functional medicine doc and let them interpret it for you right so again this is it's all about saving our hearts, right? As soon as possible. Yeah, and the stakes are so high and there's such a high- It really is high. And you know, what is it, every 36 seconds, someone is die, gonna die or has died of a heart attack, mm-hmm. right? That's that's huge. And- and What are the tests, Dr. Sandra? Let's go into that next. What are the tests that you do in your clinic? Uh, do you wanna share some vignettes or stories about how these tests have helped people with silent? phenomena, avoid uh, untoward outcomes and what you're hearing from people about uh, well, getting I'll, to work I'll, with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell I can tell you a great story. It's it's about with my brother and uh, we just did a podcast on Sunday um, and it's super, super fun to hang out with your brother on a podcast for your first time. And, and, and it's really about um, his story. It's my story too, because we have the same parents, but uh, he's an athlete, you know, he's a smart guy, PhD, scientist, chemist, you know, inventor, just ran a triathlon a couple weeks ago. And, and he really, you look at him and he looks and he's, you know, he's 56. He looks like the picture perfect of health, right? He goes in to see his, you know, primary practitioner and, and, you know, they do the standard lipid. And this was done over a decade ago. And I'm Bob, your, your, your lipids are a little bit high. You know, we could think about putting you on a statin. And my brother's like, well, I'm in that time he was like forties, right? He's like, well, why do I want to be on a statin? It's not that high. I'll just, you know, exercise more, eat a little better. You know, my wife's a nutritionist, you know, um, and wellness coach. So I'll just, you know, I'll be fine. But what they didn't do is they didn't, check for insulin resistance. They didn't even do a, a hemoglobin A1C. They didn't, you know, do the appropriate cardiac markers, right? And so, and what are those markers? But let's just jump to that. So a really important one for him is that APOB, AP, AP, apoproptin B pattern, right? And that is a, a cholesterol pattern. And, and that is if it's greater than 130 milligrams per deciliter, that's a problem, okay? So his were not tested. He Recently we had his cardio 
um, testing the advanced lipid panel, which is cardio IQ by Quest Diagnostics, right? We recently had that done and we, we learned about all these markers being that one, that pattern, which is putting them at two to three times higher risk for heart disease. And then we also were able to get the LDL particle number and size. We realized he had a lot of the small density LDL, which is uh, very concerning, as well as that LP little a, okay? And that is in regards to plaque and whether we have the ability to break down the plaque in our arteries. So his was high, so he was at risk, right, for inability to break down plaque in his arteries. Um, and these are, I will have to say, um, the, the 2018, right, they kind of updated the cholesterol management, right? And they came out with the CVD risk, cardiovascular disease risk enhancers, right? And these were on that list in 2018. But Unfortunately, we're not checking for those. And, and my brother has been seeing a practitioner, you know, every year for through this course, this time, right? Um, and he did develop AFib, right? And he was found to have, in that course, he had a cardiac ablation and they didn't test for sleep apnea, which he had severe sleep apnea. So there's, there's a lot of misses because he looked like a healthy guy, right? He didn't look like the classic overweight or morbidly obese person who the patient or the, the, car, the practitioner was alerted to, oh, well, we need to really dig into their, their risk factors. But he was dismissed just because of the way he looked. So what is the take home message is that um, just because you have an athlete or a physically fit person walk in your door, you can't ignore their, their genetics. You can't ignore the possibility that they could be uh, struggling with insulin resistance, right? Or that they're lacking micronutrients, cofactors for these biochemical processes, right? So there's a lot to that human being that's sitting in front of you. And, and we really need to get better at our screening and our testing. That's, that's my message that I wanted to get across today. And, and he is um, a great story. You can you know, get on my uh, Coastal Functional Medicine, my podcast and listen to us. Uh, big, big brother and little, little sister talk. It's kind of fun, but. Cool, well, for today's purposes, we should probably do a couple of connect the dots moments because I think our audience will have a couple of questions. So did you test your brother's uh, carotid uh, via this ultrasound testing and so that, that's kind of it's coming up and he's he's on the schedule for that mm -hmm. um but what we were able to do is get his uh, uh primary care practitioner to order a coronary calcium mm -hmm. scan and that showed that he was in the 87 percentile right <sighs> which is not good right, right. so let's talk about that so soft plaques form in blood vessels of the body, the arteries, the oxygen carrying blood vessels, and then soft plaque on average will transition over into what's called mature plaque around six months or something. So if, uh, if I'm hearing you right, you and I are both in our fifties. So any plaques we have in our arteries that have been there beyond on average about six months. And again, you can correct me if I have any of this wrong, we're going to tend to put some calcium in there. And then a, a CT scanner that looks at the blood vessels of the heart with a very low dose radiation CT scan. If we have mature plaque over the course of our lifetime, we just see it light up white because of the calcium. So this screening test is a really powerful tool for people who want to know, do I have plaque or not? Uh, they, they can... Uh, or blood vessel disease, they can do this sophisticated carotid ultrasound that you described. They can do a CAT scan of their heart to look for total lifetime cholesterol burden. And so now his primary is going to be getting that done and he's going to have it in tighter focus, whether or not these risk factors have translated to actually laying down uh, things. And now he knows that 
he has laid down some plaque yeah, and he's going to really bring his a game from here onward to, to working on those risk factors. Are you and your brother talking about non-drug solutions to bring lipoprotein a down and increase LDL particle size? Is he now at a point a statin is necessary, even though most of your, my patients would prefer to avoid statins for plaque stabilization? Where's that all going? Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's a good question. So he's not opposed to a statin. And we, we realized that there are particular genetic markers out there that we need to check for to see if a, that particular statin is appropriate. Right. And so the one that I've been learning about is the KIF6. And that is a particular genetic marker, right, to see if that individual is going to respond to that statin. I mean, there's no point in taking a statin if if your gene variant isn't going to work right for that statin. Right. You're just going to set up for lots of side effects from that statin. Um, But, you know, also the APOE4 or if he has that genotype. So we're waiting to get that back as well as the, the 9P21, right? That's a big one. It's getting a lot of uh, publicity right now that that's the heart attack gene. okay? Mm-hmm. So we're waiting for those to come back. Um, but to answer your question, he is doing a lot of alter- alternatives, uh, berberine, uh, bergamot, niacin, uh, the, the, the Reggie's rice. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of options that, and of course, treating the microbiome, you know, get on some anti-inflammatories, um, butyrate. There's, there's a lot of things that we can do to lower inflammation in our bodies and target our gut, right? So he's got to get some gut testing too. We're in the process of doing that. Um, so, and he doesn't want to take a statin. He really doesn't. He really doesn't. He's, you know, he's tried the pharmaceutical route before, uh, had a lot of side effects. He almost bled out um, from Coumadin when he had AFib. And he's just, you know, fortunately the ablation is, it was successful. And, but he was told that he's going to have to have repeated ablations in the future, right? So, but what they didn't talk about, of course, the, the risk factors and, you know, what are the root causes that, that we can work on to prevent recurrent AFib, right? Um, so we've talked about that. We're working on that. And of course, sleep apnea is a big one. So he's being treated for that right now. Um, alcohol is, is a big one to cause AFib. So he's reduced that significantly. Um, so, so yeah, it really is all about these lifestyle modifications and how we can help patients prevent these things from happening in the first place. And, um, and I, and I kind of wish I, I knew a little bit more about functional medicine a decade ago so that I, I could have helped him. Um, yeah. Yeah. and even my father who had a heart attack at 51, you know, uh, I was, I was pretty young at that time, but knowing what I know now, I could have helped family members sooner. Yeah. I think a lot of us in functional medicine have benefited from it for ourselves and or had poignant moments around what would have been really nice to know when for, for people that we care about and love. I should mention for our audience that Dr. Sandra is referencing another heart issue the abbreviation for which is AFib and the long medicalese version is atrial fibrillation. Fibrillation is the heart sort of making this wiggly pattern when uh, pumping action occurs as opposed to a good regular squeezing action. And then the atria, that's the orchestra conductor at the top of the heart. And uh, so in terms of challenges for her brother, who that's, I think that's kind and courageous that he's willing to have his story help others I should acknowledge that that uh, these rhythm issues including atrial fibrillation are related loosely but separate from this issue of how much uh, blockage is in the blood vessels just so that folks take it away from today that we got to hear about two phenomena both of which are getting illuminated sooner for dr sandra's brother and 
that particular vignette or, or clinical uh, thumbnail sketch of his story is so powerful because it walks all the way through uh, the, the pitfalls of not identifying problems early all the way to another state-of-the-art thing that's happening, which is we now have genetic testing to know which medications work for which people. So we are just with his story and what you're sharing, we're able to let people know that it's absolutely mind-blowing what's available now. And I, and I hope to motivate them to, like you said, to go ahead and find folks that have the training and the interest, because this is this is really solid mainstream stuff coming out in terms of the science itself, the folks that comment, the folks that recommend it. It just it simply takes a while for really, really important information to get all the way through to the point that it's being widely adopted in the conventional setting. Why is that? I think that's a separate conversation. I'm not sure even matters to our audience, but yeah. um, Super and and bottom line, it doesn't matter as doesn't long matter. as we, yeah. as long as we just get it done, yeah. you know, and, and not point fingers, right? And just say, and, and educate. And that one thing I appreciate you t- telling me a long time ago, or like maybe it wasn't that long ago, maybe it was this year. Um, you said, you know, you have an obligation to teach your community, teach your colleagues and, and, and get the word out. Right. And, and that really resonated with me that, that when you said that, and I, and I really like a little light bulb went on and I said, you know, he's right. I, I can't be afraid. I've got to just speak and teach and let people know to, to be empowered. And, and again, I'll say it again, knowledge is power. It really is. So get the testing done. Um, uh, if you if you live in Alaska, definitely contact Rob. <laughs> and he'll interpret the test for you. <laughs> I guess if they're willing to travel to Homer, Alaska, then anybody can see you, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, or see Dr. Sandra. Or me, um, come to California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's really gracious of you to, to mention that. I, I want to add to that positive feedback that I really appreciate that I don't have any trouble feeling humble about how challenging it is to do primary care, how challenge you and I both know that when we're in the intensive care unit, when we're in the ER, uh, when we're in a primary care setting with 24 people a day, just with tons and tons of stuff going on, this conventional proactive approach, you have to go out of your way to go find this information and be really interested because of, of sort of the deluge of troubleshooting Mm -hmm. that's happening in, in this whole sort of system. And so I, I just think it's so nice that we can create these safe harbors for folks to learn and do more with us. And clearly the, the enthusiasm and the excitement of, of folks who who find out about something like this and then they get to actually have it interpreted by those of us who've gone on and gotten the IFM training. It's really, it's really gratifying. And most importantly, we have we have that peace of mind at night and our patients have that peace of mind at night that uh, they've intuited or that they've grasped via common sense more needs to be done sooner and they have that reassurance that it is being done. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Well, is there anything that's super important to you that we didn't get to talk about today? Any closing thoughts? Oh, no, I think that we covered a lot of ground, a lot (laughs) of territory, and I think a lot of messages were brought forth in this short meeting and I'm happy to do it again anytime and we can dig even deeper. Um, I didn't even get to talk about all the stages of atherosclerosis and of the plaque formation and uh, mm-hmm. may not be interesting to some people, but uh, I love that stuff. But um, yeah, thanks again for having me uh, on this podcast and um, I'm, I'm ready to do it again, whenever you are. Really appreciate sharing your time and wisdom and I share a great sense of enthusiasm for ongoing collaboration. Where can people find you, Dr. Sandra? So coastalfunctionalmed.com. I'm also okay. on Instagram, Facebook, 
and uh, LinkedIn, all that good social media stuff. We'll um, put all those links in the show notes. So okay. people will be able to all right. find all that. Well, thanks again and have a great day. You too. Thanks for joining us for the Seaworthy podcast. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. If you think we've earned it, please consider giving this podcast a like, subscribing, and giving us a five-star rating on the platform of your choice. Thanks.